Hi, I'm Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well, thanking you for checking out this Parents and Caregiver series brought to you by Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative. Hi, I'm Michael P. Coleman, Content Director for Brother Be Well. Today, in one of a series of Brother Be Well conversations in our Parents and Caregiver series, made possible by the support of Blue Shield of California's Blue Sky Initiative, we're covering strategies for identifying behaviors in our children that might be signs of serious mental health conditions. Our partner for this conversation is the name you know, marriage and family therapist and Brother Be Well clinical advisor, Christian Jacobs. Christian, welcome back to Brother Be Well. Hi, Michael, thanks for having me back. Really good to have you. Let's jump right into this one, man. You know, noticing behaviors that may foretell a mental health issue and understanding mental health among people of any age isn't easy. But we need to acknowledge that those behaviors can be particularly difficult to spot in children. Why is that, Christian? Well, you know, one of the biggest issues and why it's so difficult to spot mental health behaviors is their inability to identify with their feelings and express how they feel. That's the number one, that's the chief concern. Um, it's also difficult to spot because uh, most chalk up their behaviors as developmental, right? They, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phase or it's a, a growth spurt they're going through. Oh, they're just going through the terrible twos, right? There's a term for it already. Or um, they stay in the room all day because that's what teens do. You know, so there's all these preconceived notions of uh, blaming, blaming on the developmental stage. Um, but you know, it's funny because but someone in the family has to be has to really be the one to say like, um, I think they need to be assessed or we need to check them out on or see what's going on. There's probably something else going on to make sure everything is okay. That's that second reassurance, you know. But there are many uh, mental health conditions that are prominent. Some that just jump out at you. They just, they just hopefully if you're able to recognize the signs, they jump out at you. Um, I wouldn't say they're easy to spot. Um, but prominent, um, but very prominent symptomology wise, meaning the symptoms are there. It's really heavy what you see. Um, there's also a cultural component, too. Um, sometimes all the signs are there um, that a child is autistic. Right. All the signs are there. Um, um, oh, he's just a shy one. That's what they'll say. Culturally, in a lot of cultures, they'll say, you know, he's a shy one or he's a quiet one in the family. When in reality, he's he's on the spectrum and he never was assessed. So uh, so the first step as parents you know, a community and family is learning what mental health conditions are more prominent in the childhood um, and also children of color, too. So that's one of the main things I would say about that. Well, you, you're talking about mental health conditions. So let's get right into that, sir. What are some of the more common mental health conditions that parents and caregivers need to be on the lookout for? Well, you know, Michael, during this time with COVID, you know, hidden families, you know, as hard as it did, experiencing financial stress. You know, with schools, you know, school shootings happening and, you know, um, as you probably already know, youth suicide is on the rise. Um, the percentages have gone up um, in incrementally in terms of uh, youth suicide and race based trauma and stress uh, that's occurring right now. And also the adaptation of youth transitioning from that home learning environment, you know, into the class in you know, those classrooms, you know, parents should be on the lookout for really signs of um, I'll kind of break it down in, in two different areas for you know, parents, right? So you're looking for that acute stress disorder. Acute stress disorder is a short period of time where, you know, um, where they, they've experienced PTSD symptoms, you know, um, whether that's hearing it, witnessing an issue or experiencing it. There's three different categories of PTSD and acute trauma. This doesn't have to happen to you directly. You can be, it can be like a word of mouth, someone telling you something or you seeing it yourself. So that's something that's really, I wanna clear that misconception up. Also race-based trauma. So some of the race-based issues that may come up, you know, people being discriminated upon based on, you know, how they look or, you know, being LGBTQIS, you know, or, you know, being treated uh, most, a lot of the trans youth are experiencing a lot of this issue. 
you know, um, also depression, anxiety, you know, some of these conditions that have happened, you know, being in the home or um, not being able to engage in their, um, their youth activity sports, something that's really been an outlet for them. Also, oppositional defiant disorder, which is something where a child has an issue with um, authority. So they have an issue, you know, listening to authority figures. So that may be something that's really prominent in the school setting um, that a lot of uh, teachers see. And also learning disorders too. So this may be due uh, from uh, being removed from a learning environment for so long. So they've been out of school for so long that now they're being put in this structured environment and being told to learn. So these are some of the things that may pop up um, that we're seeing in schools in, and also in private practice and you know these public health practices in the county. Um, but for caregivers in particular, I want to say that foster parents, you know, they should be on the lookout for those conditions. But in addition to, these are more related to uh, foster children um, and caregivers, you know, uh, uh, grandparents who, uh, or co-parenting situations where a child is going back and forth to different homes or reactive attachment disorder, which is really a consistent pattern of, um, of um, being emotionally withdrawn. So that's toward a caregiver. So they don't, um, they don't need anything. You know, they, they, don't, they don't reach out and say, hey, I need a toothbrush. Hey, I need new clothes. Um, hey, I'm hungry. So reactive attachment disorder um, is one of the prominent ones too. Separation anxiety, basically is one of, uh, this happens with the little ones more often where, you know, you, see, you may see this all the time where, you know, they're dropping them off at kindergarten and they're holding on to mommy's leg, daddy's leg. You know, that separation anxiety, um, when it happens for a long period of time over, uh, uh, over uh, two to four weeks. Social anxiety and also um, social um, dis um, disinhibition or disorder too. That's one of the big ones because they have no inhibitions. They'll go to anyone. They'll run off to any uh, person they see, uh, adult. That's not safe either. So those are some of the main symptoms and uh, disorders that you may see right now. And that's quite a list of disorders, Christian. So help us, help us, uh, all of our parents and caregivers get at what those behaviors, those concrete behaviors that we should be vigilant about looking for that might foretell that one of those those conditions is, is present? What are some of those specific behaviors that we need to look oh, for? Oh, sure. Uh, sure. You know, I think it really depends on the age. So from zero to five, right, that, that early childhood developmental stage, you want to pay attention to how the child is thriving. You know, um, you know that, that little infant that you see, I'm, I'm starting from zero. <laughs> are they cooing? You know, are they making eye contact? You know, uh, in the toddler years, are they verbal? Are they starting to put words together? Are they starting to, you know, talk a little bit? Um, are they having outbursts? Here's some of the signs you want to look for. Um, some of the assessments that are going on in your mind. You know, um, how frequent are their outbursts? How often do they happen? In the adolescent years, pay attention to their self-talk. You know, how are they talking to themselves? Um, what does their social interactions look like? Do they have any friends? Are they hanging out with people? Or are they kind of isolating and talking negative about being in social circles? Um, are they socially appropriate uh, around other peers? That's another big one. You know, um, what I mean by that, do they respect other, um, their, their peers, do they expect, or respect their space? You know, are they aware of the words or behaviors and emotions that are harmful to others? These are also early signs that people look into in terms of aut um, autism. You know, do they talk down on themselves a lot? Um, are they negative? Uh, some other ones are just a few indicators. Um, there's many more. And um, radars for parents to use when assessing their child. These are some of the radars uh, that you want to put on your tool belt. Also, pay attention to the change of behaviors in the school, home, and social settings. You know, so once they, um, for example, one time they may have been a straight-A student, student, all of a sudden they're failing all their classes. Um, something else to be um, really vigilant about is somatic issues, you know, physical symptoms, you know, uh, such as weight loss, significant weight loss or weight gain or not sleeping or, you know, talking about self-harming, you know, picking their skin or pulling their hair out. These are some of the symptoms that you see um, as a, um, that what a child is going through some early mental health conditions. It seems to me, Kristen, and, and I, I'm trying to sort of um, connect the dots a little bit in, in, in what the information you just gave us, but I heard the word change come up quite a lot. And I'm also thinking about, you said weight loss or weight gain. Again, that's a change in, in, the standard weight of, of a child that we might be thinking about. Is it safe to say that if there's a significant, um, maybe abrupt change in any behavior, because you got to take personality into account, if there's a shift in the change of behavior, that may be a sign that something's going on? Um, absolutely. You know, uh, there, whether it's mental health related or not, there's something happening, right? And as parents, you know, uh, we have to be you know concerned about 
any change that's going on significantly. So one thing that will help parents and caregivers as well is reading up on the stages of early childhood development and those common behaviors at each stage or attending uh, some parenting classes that will help understand this process. Um, there's a light, um, there's a light reading out there on this topic. And when I, when people hear parenting classes, they automatically think, oh, I'm a bad parent. And parenting classes aren't for bad parents. They're for parents who want to get better at parenting. So, you know, just because you're taking these classes or, you know, you decide to enroll yourself in some of those things doesn't mean you're a bad parent. Um, this will also come in handy when a parent is trying to determine if there's a particular behavior. Um, is, is it typical in, in development or, you know, a teen spending more, you know, time, you know, with their friends and they're withdrawing from their family, you know, uh, or something to be concerned about. But when you understand their early childhood development, it will kind of make more sense to you that this is typical for a teenager to, you know, withdraw from their family a little more and want to hang out with their friends, you know. Um, but regardless of its normal, you know, childhood development or signs of a mental health condition, a parent should always stay vigilant and observe, you know, patterns and behaviors because, Ignoring or not or, or uh, not meeting or disregarding those behaviors can really lead to uh, other mental health conditions. I love the, the the point that you just made, Christian, about parenting classes. It's not for bad parents; it's for parents that want to be better. Uh, I've got a feeling anybody listening to this or watching this, you're already on the right track. You wouldn't be watching this video if you didn't want to do better. And that's not to say you're doing a bad job, but but. Those resources are designed to help you get even better. So I really appreciate that. Let's take a look at those warning signs. Let's go a little bit deeper, Christian. So a parent or caregiver notices a warning sign or two, what does he or she do? The first thing you would do, you know, is really you want to go into observation mode, right? Um, as parents, sometimes you want to go into crime detective mode, right? But you want to be vigilant to make sure you're going into that observation mode. Uh, Crime detective mode causes children sometimes to become defensive and they shut down. So observation mode is paying attention to those behaviors that um, have changes significantly, you know, those significant changes. Uh, and also, this is actually, I should have said this one first, is model the appropriate behavior that you want to see. You know, oftentimes depression in children uh, shows up as anger, you know, moodiness and like, attitude, you know, uh, because they don't know how to express their feelings at, this, at that time. So when their voice rises, keep yours low. They just keep going up. You keep yours at a certain level. At that same level, you're modeling the behavior you want them to see. As hard as it may be to raise your voice, so don't you talk back to me, don't talk loud to me. You keep your voice at the same level as they keep going up. And it cognitively does something to them. Um, try to establish a way to communicate, you know, in natural, relaxed settings, and then, and then discuss what you've observed about their change of behavior. Hey, I noticed that, you know, you um, don't go out and ride your skateboard as much observations, you know, are helpful. Also know what behaviors are mild, moderate, and severe. So you want to observe self-inflicting injuries such as, um, these are some more severe, such as um, um, excessive hair pulling, you know, skin picking, um, intermittent outbursts. So they're having outbursts throughout the day over something very small, uh, self-defeating talk about their self, uh, suicidal talk, um, these are some things that you really want to seek a mental health professional immediately when you see these things.